Pastor Byron is ready for the three o'clock session, and we'll get to enjoy. Be blessed. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Welcome back, everybody. I feel like I should have you all stand up and do some jumping jacks so you don't fall asleep after that wonderful, wonderful Kenyan potluck, right? That's right. Everybody stand up. Woohoo! Stand up. Okay. Ready? We're going to do a couple of jumping jacks. I'm, I, I hope I don't split my shirt or my pants or something. <laughs> Because then I couldn't preach. All right, on the count of three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, that's good. Now you're awake, right? Okay. I, I did that mostly for my wife because she told me she was sleepy. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Glad you're here to join us. And um, before we do our, our presentation for, for this afternoon session, I want to make sure that each of you got one of these when you came in, that you registered. If you didn't, I'll have our ushers pass those out. But I want to do a little quiz with you about hymns. Okay? So... Um, do any of you know what the special hymn for golfers is? If you're a golfer, what is your hymn? There is a green hill far away. Okay. Now, what if you are a shopper? What if you love to shop? What's your hymn? That was a good guess. In the sweet by and by, right? <laughs> okay, what if you are a dentist? What is your special hymn if you're a dentist? Crown him with many crowns, right? <laughs> what about if you're a gossip? What's your hymn if you're a gossip? <laughs> Not bad. Pass it on, right? Pass it on. Now, what if you are an IRS agent? What is the IRS agent's hymn? <laughs> Bringing in the sheaves, that's not bad. That's pretty good, but I have a better one, maybe. See what you think. IRS agent's hymn, I Surrender All. <laughs> now, what about, okay, for those of us that maybe have heavy feet on the gas pedal when we're driving, at 55 miles an hour, your hymn is, God will take care of you. At 65 miles an hour, your hymn is, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. At 75 miles an hour, your hymn is, Nearer, my God, to Thee. At 85 miles an hour, it's Nearer, Still Nearer. At 95 miles an hour, it's, Lord, I'm coming home. And at 100 miles an hour or above, it's just precious memories. <laughs> Yes, there you go. I got to remember that. That's a good one, actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and uh, let's invite the presence of the Lord to open his word to our hearts and minds and our understanding. Heavenly Father, I am just always in awe of Jesus and your goodness and your patience, your mercy toward us. I thank you that no matter where we've been, no matter what our past is like, you can undo it and you can give us a new future. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we study your word this afternoon, that you will touch us and that you will speak to us 
that your love for us will be clear and that the power of your word will show us the way to a new life. And so we give you this time and we give you our hearts. I give you my lips. May it all be for your name's honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our subject for this session is entitled Blood, Water, and the Woman. Have you ever wished that you could start something all over again? Now, earlier on, I, I told you the story about uh, the, the secluded lake that our family has a lodge on in British, up in British Columbia, Canada. The, the lake that we flew into, remember I told you about how my dad crashed his airplane? All right, so, so I got another story, and, and we, you know, obviously we love to vacation at this, this wonderful spot, and like I mentioned, we have to fly into it because there aren't any roads that, that go there, but on one occasion, my two brothers and I, we decided that we wanted a, a, a grand adventure, and we decided, and you know what, we're not going to fly in, what we want to do is we want to ride ATVs. You know what an ATV is, right? An all-terrain vehicle, a four-wheeler. We said we want to we want to ride a, our four we want to ride four-wheelers into the lake. So part of the way there's a little bit of a road. Sometimes there's a little bit of a trail, and sometimes there's nothing to go by. But we knew we had a map and we had a compass, and 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 we knew part of the way. And there was mainly a river called the Blackwater River that we were going to be following along. And and what was exciting that was about a hundred miles of wilderness that we were going to be crossing on our ATVs. And and the exciting thing about it was that we were going to camp out under the stars at night. We were going to fish the Blackwater River, one of the prime. It's one of the premier fly fishing destinations in the world, by the way, there in British Columbia on the Blackwater River. And um, this is not my brothers or I or any of us, but that's the kind of a beautiful rainbow trout that you can catch there on your fly rod. And trust me, there's little, there's little that's like catching a fish like that on a fly rod. It's so much fun. And so we were excited to, to do this trip um, uh, while, uh, while everybody else flew it in the airplane. And, and so what we had to do is we had to borrow some ATVs from relatives and friends because we didn't have any. And we loaded them in a truck and a trailer, and we drove to the ranch where we were going to unload. We unloaded, we packed our gear on the ATVs, and we took off, and we headed in to uh, the lake, to Uchinico Lake. And we had two days of the greatest fun and adventure that you could ever imagine. And, uh, and we got in, then we spent about a week there at the cabin enjoying everything, and then it was time to leave. Now, on the trip out, we, we'd stayed there at the cabin as long as we possibly could. And so we were planning on, because we'd been in and we knew the way now, we figured that what we did in two days, we were going to try to do it in about six or seven hours. So there was no playing around. There was no stopping to fish. Uh, it was just, we're just going to hightail it straight out to the ranch where we had unloaded the, 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 the four-wheelers, and then, then we would drive home from there. And so in order to do this, we planned on, you know, going lighter than we came in. By the way, have you ever wished you could start something over again? Because, you see, I'd been driving my dad's truck, and he'd given me his keys for the truck, and his keys, my dad's keys, I don't know if any of you have a dad like this, but it's, it's not like the keys to the car and the house. It's the key to everything in the world. And, and the key ring is so big, you, you, you know, you got to have a wheelbarrow to take, take it around. I mean, the thing is just massive. And, and I'd been carrying that thing around in my pocket most of the week. And it was so big and it, it, it wore a sore spot on my leg. I had a bruise on my leg from the keys. And I was sick and tired of the keys. And so I took the keys out of my pocket and I put them in my camera bag because I knew they'd be safe there and I knew where they were. Have you ever wished that you could start something over again? Because the day that we decided we were going to go out... We didn't want to take extra gear, and I wasn't going to be fishing, and I wasn't going to be taking pictures. And so all the extra gear that we didn't take, we loaded in the airplane to go home with those people who were flying, and we went light. 
Have you ever wished? So my brothers and I, we made great time. We did. We got out to the ranch in less than six hours. We, we, we drove up in a, crowd, a cloud of dust on our four-wheelers, jumped off our four-wheelers, congratulated ourselves, dusted off a little bit. And then my brother Andrew looked at me and said, well, Byron, he said, better unlock the truck. Let's load these things up and get this show on the road. Have you ever wished you could start over again? I put my hand in my pocket to get the keys, and they weren't there. And then I checked every pocket, and even places I didn't have pockets, and no keys. And then I remembered. I was so sick of the keys, I put them in my camera bag, and I loaded it on the airplane. And now my keys are at 9,000 feet flying the opposite direction in a Cessna airplane. And we're at a ranch 100 miles from the closest city. Have you ever wished? And my brothers looked at me. Yeah, I wanted to crawl under a leaf or something. You know what I'm saying? It, uh, it was so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you've wished that you could start again. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. Maybe you wished that you could start again when the guilt of a wicked past came catching up with you. Maybe you wished you could start again when you made some bad choices and you were suffering the consequences. Maybe you wished you could start again when you've been taken advantage of or, or when you hated yourself for all the mistakes. Knowing what we know now, wouldn't it be nice if we could begin life again? and not make some of the same mistakes and same choices we've made in the past? How much heartache and how much sorrow could we avoid if we could begin again? Now I want to share with you some hope because Revelation opens the door of insight into some powerful, powerful symbols. And I want to start right here in Revelation 15 verse 2. Then I saw something like a sea of glass. Notice this. The sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now, what I want to point out here, dear friends, if you want to go to another scripture, you can stay here, but then we'll just be going a couple pages to Revelation 7. Daniel, when he had his vision, we studied Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 7, the four animals that came up out of the sea, right? In his vision, he says the four winds were striving upon the sea. The sea was all roiled up. It was, it was rough. It was wavy. It was tempestuous. Now, in Revelation, it's a sea of what? Glass. Daniel sees the nations in commotion. He sees the upheaval. He sees the roughness. He sees the turbulence. The nations are at un, in, in unrest and in commotion. John in Revelation 15, he sees the saints on a sea of glass. It's peaceful. It's smooth. It's calm. The struggle is over. The nations are at peace. How did it get that way? Revelation chapter 7. That's the water. Revelation chapter 7, and I want to start reading in verse 9 with you here. And the Bible says this, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing on the throne, or standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Now drop down to verse 13. Then one of the elders uh, answered and said to me, Who are these that are arrayed, arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. 
And so this is talking about this special group, the same group of people that John saw over there in Revelation 13, or 15, and they are the woman because they're God's people, and it says that they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and it says they're righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, and that they have come out of great tribulation. Let's keep reading in verse 14 there. Sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so that's the same group that was in Revelation 15. They came out of tribulation. They came out of the unrest. They came out of the turbulence. But now the sea was calm when John saw it in Revelation 13 or in Revelation 15. They have been changed through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and his salvation. And that's why the waters are calm in chapter 15. Turn back to Revelation chapter 1 with me. What does this have to do with washing away our dark past and coming to this calm? How does this, what does this have to do with all this? How is it that the sea can be calm? How is it that we can be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and over the king and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How do we come to this new beginning? How do we come to this place of calm after the darkness of the turbulence of our, our lives here on earth and the things we've been through? Revelation says that it happens by being washed from our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation then goes on to say we become kings and priests. And so, dear friends, what I want to tell us is that not only is their dark, rotten past gone, but we're given a new and a glorious and a wonderful future. It's one that you can only get by birth because to be a king or a priest, you have to be born, at least in the Bible when you look at it, you have to be born into that family, right? You had to be born a Levite if you were going to be a priest. You had to be born into the royal lineage of Judah if you were going to be the king. And so you can only get it through being born in that family. So my question is, how can we who are born aliens, how can we who are considered to be outside of God's family because of our sinful nature, how can we receive that royal heritage? Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. According to the Bible, living your life over again, getting to start again, is called the miracle of being born again. Jesus was explaining it one evening to a wealthy, educated Jewish man centuries ago. This Jewish man thought that he had everything that this world could offer because he was highly educated, he was very wealthy, he was highly respected, he belonged to the most powerful governing body in the Jewish nation, the Sanhedrin. And so he thought he had everything that the world had to offer, but he was still empty inside. He was still unfulfilled, still knowing he was searching for something more. And this man, because of his position and his wealth, he was ashamed to come to Jesus by day. He didn't want anybody seeing him asking questions, maybe questioning his past beliefs and coming to new beliefs. He was rich. He was intelligent. He was influential. He'd been educated in the elite universities. He was dressed for success, shopped in all the best places, wore the latest styles and the best colognes, had all the answers, but he didn't have any answers. He was somebody who was really nobody. And after tasting of life, and after spending the best years that his life had to offer, getting what he thought would make him happy, he was still unhappy. He was still unfulfilled. 
Sounds like a lot of people in Dallas today, doesn't it, folks? But back to the rich Jew. He came to Jesus by night. Let's read the story here. Verse, uh, John chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named, you know who it is, right? Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You, you know, it's interesting to me, uh, Jesus just, he dives right to the heart of the question, right? I mean, Nicodemus is, he's going with all this fluff, you know, trying to butter him up. We know that you're a teacher, come from God, blah, 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 you know. And, and Jesus, he doesn't mess with any of that. He just goes right to the jugular. You can't be in heaven unless you're born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, now you can't tell me that Nicodemus, being as smart as he was, didn't understand that Jesus was not talking about physical stuff here, right? But, but I think Nicodemus is trying to make excuses. And so he goes, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? By the way, thank God, right? Thank God that can't happen. <laughs> At least you ladies are saying that, right? By the way, we men, we don't understand what this all given birth is all about. We have no clue. Although I've had men tell me that having a kidney stone may approximate, may approximate childbirth. You don't think so. Okay, well, but, 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 but let me say this. <laughs> think about this. Maybe a kidney stone is worse. Hear me out for a minute, okay? Hear me out for a minute. You go through the pain of childbirth. And when you go through all that pain and it's all done, they put a beautiful, precious baby in your arms and you get to hug it and hold it and kiss it and you have something to show for all your pain. When you get through the pain of delivering a kidney stone, they flush it down the toilet and there's nothing to show. All right, we'll continue that conversation later, right? But in any case... Yeah, no, not enter literally into the womb and be born. Jesus goes on in verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And so, Jesus told him how important it was to be born again. How important is it, ladies and gentlemen? Is it just a nice idea? Is it just like an option that maybe you want to consider, but it's not really necessary? He said, you will never enter the kingdom of God or see the kingdom of God it's not just a good idea. It's not something you do just because you feel like it or you want to. It's so important that Jesus said you will never come into that experience of the kingdom of God unless you go through the new birth. And there in the darkness, Jesus tenderly brought hope to Nicodemus and told him that the way to happiness was through new birth. You see, that new birth, that rebirth, it's allowing the Holy Spirit to transform your inner being. You, you kind of like this picture shows, you kind of start out there, all beat up and broken and past that you're ashamed of. But the Holy Spirit comes along and He begins to change you. And He begins to transform you. And, and He makes us into a new person where we discard our present life entirely. We don't cling to anything because we surrender it all to Jesus. We give Him 
full control. We don't say, well, Lord, you know what? I really want to start again, but I got this habit I want to take along with me. But I got this here lust that I want to take along with me. Rebirth is exactly that. It's rebirth. It's not renovating the old life. It's not modifying the old life. It's not dressing up the old. It's not a makeover for the old life. It's not putting cosmetics over the mess, right? Oh, I better be careful. Uh, <laughs> it's totally starting new again with Jesus. It's allowing God to plant His nature within us so that our desires are different, our attitude is different, our outlook is different, and, and, and our, our, our whole focus of life is different. Rebirth occurs through the conversion in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And then second of all, it said, wa it said water. You have to go through the water. And so baptism, water baptism, becomes a part of this. But is that really important as we're talking about this? Did you know that baptism is mentioned 80 times in the Bible? You better believe it's important. You and I can know all there is to know about Revelation, all there is to know about the Antichrist and the beast and 666, but if you haven't been born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Why? Why? Because we're all sinners, and sinners need forgiveness, and sinners need salvation. We need mercy, we need restoration, we need new characters because ours are filthy and evil. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Baptism is the outward evidence of the new life that Jesus has put within us and is putting within us day by day. It's the outward sign of it, the outward evidence of it. How else will the world know Jesus Christ if you do not show it through your changed life? How else will the world know the Christ that went to Calvary for them if we do not go to Calvary for Jesus? Jesus gave up everything to redeem us from our sins. Why wouldn't we be willing to give up everything to walk with Him? But there are really some misconceptions that people have about baptism. And one of them is that it doesn't really matter. As long as you have Jesus in your heart, it doesn't matter about baptism. Well, let's look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. It says, He who believes and is what? Baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And so Jesus is giving here two prerequisites for salvation. The first is belief. We've got to believe in Jesus. And by the way, this is more than just a knowledge of the truth. Belief in Jesus is more than just saying that what we've heard is right. It's just more than something that's in your head because guess what? The Bible says that the devils, what? Believe. And they tremble. But let me ask you this. The devils, they believe, but are they saved? No, they're not saved. So they believe, but they're, not, but they're not saved. So let me ask you this question. What is the difference between your belief that you think is going to save you and the belief the devils have that doesn't save them? We better know, huh? Because we can't just say, I believe. We have to understand what is the difference in that belief. Well, let me try to illustrate the difference here. Genuine belief. You can always tell genuine belief, and all maybe you can figure this out. So look at this here beautiful chair, right? It's actually just kind of like the ones you're sitting on down there, right? Now, I believe in this chair. I believe, I mean, this is a, a, a comfortable chair. I believe it's a solid chair. I believe it's a well-constructed chair. I believe this chair was created to easily hold 400 pounds. If you, I believe that if I weighed 400 pounds, I could sit on this chair and it wouldn't let me down. I believe in this chair. Now this is, I believe that this chair would hold me up if I were to sit in it. It's a wonderful chair. And I believe in this chair. I really believe in this chair that I could sit on it and I'd be fine. And you're saying what? If you believe in it, what? Sit in it. Because I can sit here and talk about it all day long and not do anything about it, right? But if I believe in this chair... Oh, 
maybe I should just preach the rest of the sermon from here. Yeah, if I believe, I act on my belief, right? I do something about it. And that's the difference between a genuine belief that saves me and the belief the devils have that doesn't save them because they believe that Jesus is Lord. But they don't do anything about it, right? They don't obey him. They don't worship him. They rebel against him. They believe, but they don't act. The belief that saves you and me is a belief that demonstrates itself it changes the way we live. It changes the way we think. And it's the way that it's kind of why God said in Jeremiah, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with what? All of your heart. That's right. There's no halfway, half-hearted, you know, seeking after God, playing little games. It takes all of our heart. We don't just, you know, say, God, hey, I'm going to negotiate with you and I'll give you this if you give me that and so on. No, there's no, I mean, it's God's way or no way. Now, that's one thing, belief, genuine belief, we act on it. Second of all, it said baptism. That's the second prerequisite. Because saving faith leads to an obedient response. You have to do something about what you believe. And baptism is the symbol of, the outward, of, of outward obedience that comes from your inner saving faith. Now let me clarify something. You say, well, in the rest of the verse it said, but, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And the reason it doesn't list baptism there is because if you don't believe, will baptism alone save you? No. If you don't believe, you could get baptized a hundred times and it wouldn't save you because it would be simply a work without Jesus. But if you believe in Jesus, you're going to act on that by taking the step of baptism because it demonstrates what he's doing in your life. Is this making sense, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, very good. And so let's go in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 13. Every man, woman, or child who comes to Jesus Christ is under obligation by His grace to follow His teachings, His commands. And one of those is that we ought to be baptized. God said it matters. Now there's another misconception about baptism that I want to touch on, and that is that I must become good enough before I come to Jesus. I must become good enough. Let's go to Jeremiah. I want to read Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23 to help us understand this issue a little bit here. Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23, it says this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or we could just as well say, can a Caucasian change their skin? Or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do what? Evil, yes. You see, many people are trying to get good enough for Christ. By the way, that's the strange act of the devil trying to persuade you and me that we can get good enough. We can never get good enough. The Bible says it right here. Let's say I'm a leopard, right? It says, can the leopard change its spots? So let's say I'm a leopard and I wake up one day and I'm sick and tired of spots. And I look over at the tiger, and I love those stripes on the tiger. And I say, oh, I want to have stripes like the tiger. Can I do that? Have you ever seen a striped leopard? I know you have leopards in Kenya. I was in Tanzania, and I saw some leopards. And I went to, what, 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 what's, oh, Serengeti, yes. Got to go to Serengeti. And we went to Ngoro Ngoro. And I will tell you this, I saw two leopards, and neither of them had stripes. So it's just as it's impossible for me to change the color of my skin, or just as impossible as the leopard to get rid of its spots, that's how possible it is for us who are born sinful to all of a sudden change and be good by ourselves. We can't do it. It's impossible. That's the whole point of Jesus, dear friends. If we were good enough, we wouldn't need Jesus. 
Jesus wants us to come to Him. Let's go in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. He wants us to come to Him as we are with whatever things we're struggling with. Come as you are. He wants us to come and then He says that He is beginning a work and He says He will do what? Look at what it says in Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will what? Complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Yet some people are saying, oh, I'll get baptized when I solve all my problems. I got to get good enough for Jesus first. No, 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 no. You come to Jesus You let Him do the work. He's the one that started the work in you. He's the one that started the work in me. Isn't that right? I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the grace of God, and neither would you. It's the grace and the drawing of the Holy Spirit that brought us all to be here and that allowed us to start giving God permission in our lives. And just like He said, He began the work in us. The Bible says He's the one that's going to finish the work in us. Waiting to get good enough is the devil's tactic to delay us so that we never make that choice. But I can tell you this, that under the preaching of the apostles, when people were confronted with the truth of God, they didn't wait to solve everything and get all the answers and get it all figured out. They stepped out with Jesus on what they knew was right, even if they still had a few questions about it. Let's take the example of the Ethiopian there in the desert, reading the Old Testament. He said to Philip, hey, do you know anything about what I'm reading here? And Philip, oh, yes, I do. I'll tell you about that. And he told them all about Jesus, shared the beautiful gospel and the puzzle came together for that Ethiopian man didn't it and it opened his heart and it opened his mind and they were driving by and it was a miracle because there in the middle of the desert there was a pool of water and he saw it and he said hey what is hindering me from being baptized you see for some of you wonderful people the puzzle is coming together in these meetings, right? And God is speaking to your heart through His Word. And and it's opening up to you. And, And the Ethiopian, when he saw the water, he said, hey, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? He didn't wait. He asked for it. Conviction came and he obeyed it. That is believing with all your heart. That is putting your faith in Jesus and showing it by acting upon it. Now, the last misconception about baptism that I want to touch on today is that some people think it's all any kind is okay as long as you have faith. Is that true? You know, it's interesting that this was years and years ago and I've never seen it, but I heard that in this film called King of Kings that Jesus was standing in the water and John the Baptist scooped up some water in a seashell and poured it on his head and baptized him. Now, dear friends, that may be all right in Hollywood, but it's not all right in Biblewood. Some people immerse, or some people baptize by pouring, some people baptize by sprinkling, some baptize by immersion. Go with me your Bibles to Ephesians. We're very close to it, Ephesians chapter 4. Some baptized by immersion. I I heard a story about one minister who was holding a baby in his arms and he laid his hands on the head of the baby, his dry hands on the head of the baby and said, I now baptize you in the name of the... Well, that must be the dry cleaning method of baptism, you know? Whatever. Uh, um, but, But does God recognize all these different sorts of baptisms? Ephesians chapter 4. There is one body, verse 4, and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, 50 baptisms. Is that what your Bible says, 50 baptisms? No, it says one baptism. The Bible says there's only one baptism that God recognizes whereby you and I can begin our lives again. Why are there so many different kinds? Let's go to Mark chapter 1. I believe there's so many different kinds because the devil does not want us to have the true experience. He wants us to get it wrong so that we have a false experience and not the one that Jesus intends for us. Jesus said there's only one way that you can demonstrate that you are beginning a new life with him and the teaching of the scripture is very clear. 
clear on this subject. Jesus, by the way, was not sprinkled with a seashell when he was baptized. And he set the example for us, didn't he, ladies and gentlemen? Mark chapter 1, let's start in verse 9 and read about his baptism. See if we can figure out how he was baptized. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. That's one clue, right? In the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens. No, no, what's the next clue? Immediately doing what? Coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, Jesus, obviously, he didn't need remission of sins. He didn't need to be baptized for his sins because he never sinned, right? Right? But Jesus wanted to show you and me who have sinned the way through that sin into a new life. He set the example. That's why he was baptized. So that what Jesus did, we believers, we want to do it too. And the Bible says that he came up out of the water. He went down into the Jordan. John baptized him in the Jordan and then he came up. You see, dear friends, there is no way to harmonize sprinkling or pouring or any other thing with the Bible because in fact, the English word that we have for baptism, it actually is a direct transliteration from the Greek word baptizo. And the Greek word baptizo means to immerse or to dip or submerge or to plunge under the water or some other thing. In other words, in fact, in ancient times, they used the word baptism, baptizo, to talk about dyeing cloth. All right? And so, if you wanted to dye a white t-shirt, completely red, would you take that t-shirt and hold it up and take red dye and sprinkle it? Flick it at it? What's that going to do? This is going to make spots on the shirt, right? The only way to dye that white shirt red is to take it and plunge it, dip it, immerse it completely in the red dye, and then when you pull it out, it is now the same color. It's and that is what that Greek word means, and that's what God uses to talk about baptism in the water, and therefore, it's a complete immersion underwater. Why? Because it's a symbol of burying the old life. And by the way, sprinkling is not burying. In fact, if you're a gardener, you sprinkle your garden to do what? Make it grow better. If all you do is sprinkle sin, you just make it grow better. If you want to get rid of sin, you got to bury that stuff, baby. You got to drown it under the water. And so every man, woman, and child in the world needs to be buried, placed under the water completely to wash that sin away. The symbol of the death, it's a, 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 it's, a re, it's a symbol baptism becomes of the rejection of our sinful nature and our dependence on God to give us a completely new life. And we need to do it God's way and not our own way. You know, there was a little girl who was among several people in, who, who wanted to be baptized. And it was in one of those churches where they give you lots of options. Now, options are nice at a car dealer. But if a church gives you a bunch of options, you better watch out. Because the Bible gives us truth. And truth is not so optional. Isn't that right, folks? Truth is truth. And so the, the, the preacher was giving them uh, there are options about how to be baptized. And, and he came to the first canon and said, well, how would you like to be baptized? Oh, I'll, I'll take sprinkling. Okay, great, we'll sprinkle you. And then how would you like, well, could I be poured? Sure, we can arrange for that. The next one came their way they would like. And finally he got down to this little girl. And when he came to the little girl, the little girl smiled and looked up at the preacher. She said, she said Pastor, she said, I want to be baptized the way Jesus was baptized. And when he heard that, the minister knew 
He was going to have to go and clean all the cobwebs and all the dust out of the baptistry in the church. And he was going to have to fill it full of water. And he was going to have to go down in that water with that girl and immerse her completely under the water, baptized the way Jesus was. Isn't that beautiful? To be baptized the way Jesus was. It's baptism by immersion, you see. Let's go in our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. You see, a new life demands a death and a burial. Romans chapter 6. Death and burial. The symbolisms of the Bible are so, so important. And maybe one of the big problems that we have in the Christian faith many times is that people are buried alive. We don't really let the old life of sin die. But that's what baptism is really all about, saying, I want that old life to die. Romans chapter 6, let's start reading in verse 3. The Bible says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His what? Death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. You see, this is Paul is describing, this is what baptism is really all about. Baptism, by the way, well, I'll come to that in a second. I shouldn't get ahead of myself. Baptism represents death and burial in the watery grave. It's a symbol of the spiritual death that we are dying to the old self of sin. Death to the old habits. Death to the old lifestyle. Death to the old animosities. Death to the old lusts and desires and grudges and old nature. The only way, friends, that you and I can live a new life fully is to die to the old life fully. That's why we have to be immersed under the water, it's burial of our sins in the watery grave of baptism, buried to that past, and then resurrected to a new life in Jesus Christ. And the good news about that is that from that moment on, the past is washed away in the blood of the Lamb, and you are beginning again, fresh and clean. You are beginning again because the past is washed away in the blood of the Lamb. And by the way, even Almighty God, sitting on His judgment throne, does not go past that day looking at your past life, your old life. So why should you? And why should you let the devil try to do that to you? Because he does, doesn't he? He loves to bring up our past. I hear people moping around about the sin and the guilt of the past. If you're not baptized, then you should mope around the sin of the past because it's all there if you're not baptized. But if you are baptized, guess what? Forget about it. Because it's gone. It doesn't count anymore. God washed it away in the most powerful cleansing agent there is in the universe for sin. The blood of Jesus Christ. Don't worry about it. It doesn't count. And so when the devil comes to remind me of my past, I remind him of his future. And I tell him he can go there right away. Right? That's what Jesus said in the Bible. Hell was made for the devil, right? It wasn't made for you and me. It was made for him, and he can go there right away. You see, our past is buried in the depths of the sea when you and I get baptized. And by the way, I heard a preacher say one time that after God buries it in the depths of the sea, he puts a no fishing sign up on the top. 
don't go digging it back up, right? Leave it there. Three simple steps, dear friends, should precede baptism so that we can enter into this experience in the best way possible. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. The first step to being baptized is to repent. This is what the Bible says. Acts 2, verse 37. After the, the people were hearing Peter preach on the day of Pentecost, it was powerful, and the Holy Spirit was there, and they were convicted. Notice what the Bible says. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And what did Peter say to them? Verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter said one of the first steps for baptism is to repent. And repentance, dear friends, is genuine heart sorrow for sin and a change and a turning away from that, of that behavior. It means that you're not just sorry because you got caught. You see the difference? Sometimes if we could get away with our sin, we would do it and we wouldn't be sorry. But then we get caught and then we're sorry. That's not real repentance. Real repentance means that I don't want to keep doing the sin whether I get caught or not, right? And so this is why, by the way, that there's no infant baptism in the Bible. Babies can't repent. Right? They don't understand the difference between right and wrong. They're too young. They're too little. Their, their minds, their consciences aren't developed enough to understand any of that. And, and so they, they, that's why in the Bible you only see the a adults, people old enough to understand the issues of sin and salvation, were baptized. Uh, repentance means that we recognize that our sins are what hung Jesus on the cross to suffer and die on Calvary. And then there comes a desire to turn away from them forever. That is repentance. So as you go to Acts chapter 8, the second step, or the second prerequisite for belief, we've already just mentioned this, it's ba or for baptism is belief. The second prerequisite for baptism, first we should repent. Second of all, we need to believe. And this is the story that we talked about, the Ethiopian who was going through the desert and Philip that was sharing the gospel with him. Verse 36, the Bible says this in Acts chapter 8. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch, now notice this, went down into the water, and he baptized him. There it is again, baptism by immersion. Verse 39, now when they came up out of the water. You see, it's always baptism by immersion, and he had to believe with all his heart that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And so that's the second step. It's the personal faith in Jesus and that means I trust what He did on Calvary's cross to pay for my sins. And second of all, that I'm willing to surrender my life to His control. I'm going to do something about what I believe. And then, as we turn to Matthew 28, what's the third step that should take place as part of our baptism process? The third step that the Bible talks about is learning. There is learning what God expects of Christians. What does it mean to be committed to a life with Jesus? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus says this, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so he says here that we should not be baptized until we're a disciple. Now what's a disciple? He says make disciples of all the nations and then baptize them. A disciple is a person who wants 
to be in a permanent relationship with their master and come to reflect their master. And so if Jesus is my master, I want to be in a permanent relationship with him. And a disciple is someone who studies what their master does. They learn to talk like the master talks. They learn to think like the master thinks. They learn to act like the master acts. And so there's some learning in the discipleship process. It, it, it's an intelligent decision that we make to be baptized because we know what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus wants to do in us and we are committed to that relationship. That's what being a disciple means. And so repent, believe, and learn the basics and then we are prepared to take that step. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we're arrived. When a baby's born, because this is being born again, right? When a baby's born, are they fully mature? Yes or no? No, they got a lot of growing to do, don't they? They don't know how to dress themselves. They don't know how to tie their shoes. They don't know how to feed themselves. They don't know how to go to the bathroom by themselves. Well, they do. They just do it in the wrong place. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of learning. And it's okay, and we love them because they're going to grow in the process. Same thing. When I get baptized, I just got to know the basics. I don't have to have it all figured out. But I got to have the basics, and I want to make that commitment to Jesus to walk with Him throughout my life and be faithful to Him because it's like a marriage relationship. It's a commitment, isn't it? There was a young man who, who was a very talented diver. And he, he had dreams to dive and compete at the Olympic level. And he was what they call a high platform diver, 10 meters. Do you know how high 10 meters is? 33 feet. Okay. 33 feet. That's a high, that's a long way when you're going to, uh, that's a way up there. I don't know if you've ever looked down at a pool of water 33 feet below you and thought about diving. You might jump, but diving head first? Anyway, he was gifted. He was talented. He wanted to, to do this. And he had dreams of the Olympic. And, and he had some Christian friends that, that shared the gospel with him. And he felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit in his life to give his heart to Jesus. But he was worried that if he gave his heart to Jesus and followed Jesus, that, that it would interfere with his dream to be an Olympic diver. And so that was more important than Jesus. And so he didn't give his heart to Jesus. And he kept training for diving in the Olympics and practicing and, and he kept hanging out with his Christian friends and they kept praying for him and they kept loving him and, him and he kept feeling the Holy Spirit pulling but he kept resisting but they didn't give up and they kept praying and one night the, the, this young man went into the, the pool where he trained, the pool complex, to the high diving platform, 10 meters, 33 feet. And it was a beautiful evening. There was a skylight in the complex. And it was a beautiful evening with a full moon and a cloudless sky. And the moon was shining in through the skylight. And the young man thought, oh, he said, you know, I'm going to dive by the light of the moon. And so he climbed up on the platform, the high platform. And he walked out to the end of the platform and he was preparing for his dive. And as he put his toes on the, on the very tip of, of the platform, and he stood and he took his pose and he stretched out his arms. The moon shining through the skylight cast the shadow of a cross on the wall in front of him. And in that moment when he saw the cross, the Holy Spirit spoke to him powerfully. And he felt that conviction. And something came over him that he needed to give his life to Jesus. That he couldn't resist any longer. And so that young man knelt down on the edge of the platform and bowed his head and prayed, giving his heart, surrendering his life to Jesus and inviting Jesus to come into his heart as his Savior. And while he was kneeling on the end of that platform, 33 feet above the pool, a janitor came in and flipped on the lights in the pool complex. And when the young man finished his prayer and opened his eyes, he looked down, and there was no water in the pool. You see, there was something wrong with the pool, and they'd had to drain it completely for repairs. And if that young man had not listened to the Holy Spirit in that moment, 
You see, obeying the Holy Spirit literally saved his life. Not just spiritually, but physically. And so, dear friends, as, as I have my, my, my friend come and play on the piano for me here, I want to give you an opportunity to listen to the Holy Spirit. So, as we hear the piano, I want you to get out that card, and I want you to think about what is Jesus inviting you to do? What step is he calling you to take in your life? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't know what the next moment will bring, do we? We have no guarantees. I could walk out of this door and I could collapse in the parking lot with a heart attack. You could walk out this door and get in your car and be in a terrible accident on the way home. We don't know what's beyond this moment, but we do have this moment to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? And so I want you to get that card out and I'm going to put some questions up on the screen, some statements. And I ask that you would prayerfully give thought to these and respond to them. If you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you in this way, that you would mark that down on that card. And then when it's done, um, where did my little basket go? I thought I got... If I can have, Karen, if you can get the basket and, and bring it in and just put it down here at the front, then we'll have people come forward with that, that basket and... and um, uh, I'll have you fill out cards. But here's the statements that I want you to think about humbly and prayerfully with the Lord. Number one, I have drifted away from Jesus, but I want to renew my commitment to Him. If you sense that somehow in your life you've kind of wandered away from Jesus, you've not been walking with Him as, as you ought, maybe you've drifted away from being in church, maybe you've started living in some kind of sin, and you know that, and you want to change that, you want to begin the journey, you want to turn around, and you want to begin the journey back home to Jesus, put a check mark in box number one. Question number two, or statement number two, I believe the baptism by immersion is how I show my love and commitment to Jesus. If you could see from our study in God's Word this afternoon, that there's only one kind of baptism that can really show our commitment to Jesus, and that's by being immersed completely under the water and then coming back up into a new life. Put a check mark in box number two. And then statement number three. If you have never been, now listen carefully, I have two different options coming up, three and four. First of all is if you have never been baptized by immersion before, I would like you to put a check mark in box number three. If you've sensed the Holy Spirit calling you to begin preparing to be baptized by immersion. Maybe you were sprinkled. Maybe you were poured. I don't know how. Maybe you've never done anything and you need to take that step. You hear the Holy Spirit saying, it's time. I'm calling you to make this relationship with Jesus a commitment. Put a check mark in box number three. Now, Maybe someone here has already been baptized by immersion once before. But maybe you did it for the wrong reason. Maybe you did it just because all your friends were doing it. Maybe you did it just because you wanted somebody to notice you or pay attention to you. I don't know. But maybe, maybe you weren't really doing it for the right reasons. Or maybe you were baptized for the right reasons and you drifted away from God and you walked out in the world and you broke your vows publicly and you disobeyed the Ten Commandments and lived in a sinful way that brought shame to the name of Jesus. And you're saying, Lord, I'm coming home today then I want to invite you to put a check in box number four, that you want to be rebaptized, that you want to renew your surrender to Jesus and show that by being baptized by immersion once again to have that past washed away. And then the last statement that I want to put on the screen for your consideration is as you think about entering into a new life, maybe there's some addiction that you're struggling with that you want help to overcome. Maybe it's tobacco, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's something else that's not on the screen. It could be anything. 
And if you want help, if you want the help and power of Jesus to help you overcome that problem, that addiction, put a check mark in box number five and then listen as, as our brother plays the piano and please come forward and drop it here in the basket and I'll just step back here and I'm just going to be in prayer as, as uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you respond to the things that you see there on the screen. Let me pray with you. Oh, Lord God, thank you so much today for the old rugged cross, for the Savior that died there so that we could be raised to a new life in him. And I pray, God, that we've listened to your Holy Spirit, that we've responded to his drawing of our hearts to make that commitment to Jesus to commit to a lifelong relationship with him and to show that by taking the step of baptism. I pray, Lord, that you will bless each and every one who's pondering that in this moment, who perhaps filled out their cards towards that or who are still thinking about it. Draw them, God. Walk by their sides. Help them to know how much you love them. Help them to know there's nothing that should stand between them and you. Help them to know that you can wash that past away and give them a new start, a new beginning, a fresh, white and clean page. I thank you, Lord, that there is power in the blood of Jesus today. And I just commit all of us now to your care and your keeping as we journey in this newfound relationship with you. Keep us close. Give us strength to resist the enemy as he tries to discourage or distract 
And Lord, we pray that you would keep us in your grace as we go from this place and bring us to study again tomorrow, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Byron. All to Jesus we surrender. One more raffle. So who is going to volunteer?